Hi, I'm Ann Goldstein, Scientific Editor at Neuron. We're here at the 79th Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Symposium on Quantitative Biology, and this year's topic is cognition. Today I'm joined with Dr. Robert Desimone, the Doris and Don Berkey Professor of Neuroscience and Director of the McGovern Institute at MIT. Dr. Desimone is known for his landmark studies in visual processing and attention. As one of the few labs that use both humans and non-human um, primates, would you mind sharing with us how you using both systems has helped inform your work and um, in ways that were expect not expected or particularly inspiring? Well, in general, the, the philosophy we follow in my lab is we, we always start with human behavior. Mm -hmm. There's something in human behavior, usually related to attention these days, that we want to try to explain. And um, often the, the, the human behavioral work has been done, we've done a little bit ourselves, but there's a huge field of human behavioral work in, in attention. Uh, and then uh, we start with the human neuroscience studies, you know, how have they informed us? Uh, and then uh, sometimes there's open questions in the human neuroscience, in which case we jump in ourselves. Uh, but in other cases, there's you know, sufficient information that we can then go to an animal study. Because in the animal study, the, the goal is to try to link what we see in humans to the underlying neuronal circuitry, which you can't do in human beings. Uh, we're getting much better at the, at the human techniques using things like magnetoencephalography combined with fMRI. Yeah. We're very excited about that. We don't do electrocorticography recordings, but a lot, a, lot, a lot of labs are starting to do that. I think that's super exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, nonetheless, you can't get to that level of neural circuits in humans. And so we, we designed the monkey studies to sort of provide that link. Yeah. And so actually going back to that use of MEG, I noticed you're going to be talking about that today, your combination of the two approaches, fMRI and MEG, and this nice paper that you recently published about um, attention, um, spatial attention versus object attention having similarities there. So you mentioned that you're using both now. Do you, how, so how did that change um, the way that you approach your work now? I mean, did that was that a big shift? And when did you guys start using this technology? Well, um, actually, when I was at the NIH, now uh, over nine years ago, uh, I pushed for NIH to get its own MEG machine. And I started playing around with the machine then, to, and we did some pilot studies and so on. At MIT, we just got our machine a little over a year ago, and, um, and so we, my, my lab was one of the first users. We jumped in, and one of my postdocs, Daniel Baldoff, uh, who had not worked with MEG before, just really jumped in and had to learn not only all that is already known in how to analyze MEG data, but how to invent a lot of his own mm -hmm. techniques, because that's an area that's much less developed than techniques for analyzing fMRI data. So uh, he did a, a huge amount of developmental work, and then and then we started the um, the studies on attention. The the thing that the um, the MEG, of course, is giving us is the exact timing of activity, and of course, that's, that's the reason for doing animal work, is you need that exact timing. Of course, you get at the level of neurons, and MEG, you get at the level of maybe areas, but uh, nonetheless, you know, we're quite interested in that in that time. Right, right. So it's nice to have the combination of the two. So the together. fMRI right, gives you yeah. the spatial localization, and uh, but but fMRI is usually limited to a second or two. Mm -hmm. And just think about all the operations your brain can carry out in a second. It's like yeah. an eternity. <laughs> all the decision making, you know, reactions, switching, and so on. Uh, but uh, but F, but MEG is working at the millisecond level. That's sort of the level at which our brains actually operate. And mm -hmm. so that's you know the interest in, in MEG. So what do you see as the future for understanding attention, and particularly for how it might be important for understanding dysfunction as well? Well, so, I mean, one of the things that we identified in, the, in this uh, latest human study is the important role the prefrontal cortex is playing in the regulation of sensory processing with object feature-based attention. And the prefrontal cortex always comes up at the top of everyone's list for uh, what might play a role in a lot of human psychiatric and neurological disorders. Uh, you know, it's, the, it's the, uh, the most developed part of the human brain. It's, uh, it's large uh, compared to the prefrontal cortex in the monkey, mm -hmm. but compared to the mouse, which many people are using, I mean, it's like orders, many orders of magnitude. The mouse has a, like a teeny, teeny, tiny prefrontal cortex. So it's, it's really what's make, it, what, it's what makes us humans, mm -hmm. is that massive prefrontal cortex. And, um, and it's clearly a, you know, very much involved in attention, and attention is very much involved in all these psychiatric disorders. People who are depressed, what do they complain about? 
can't focus my attention, I can't concentrate. Mm -hmm. um, people um, with um, lots of learning disorders, attention deficit disorder, you know, it's an obvious one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's this aspect of focusing, keeping on track, blocking out distraction is what, um, I mean, we all have a problem with that, but people with psychiatric disorders often have an even worse problem. Mm -hmm. So it, it's focused our attention on this part of the brain and we'd like to be doing studies on that. Great. Um, and in conclusion, I also noticed that on your website that you have a, a focus or interest on um, overtly too much information in general. So there's how do we how do we deal with too much information in this very fast age that we live in now? With lots of technology, lots of video games, and, and so on, the phones. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, it, the um, what I'm going to what I'm going to give you as my advice is going <laughs> to sound totally trivial. But try not to use your brain for having to block out all that distraction. Try to eliminate it from the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you will be infinitely better off if you can eliminate distraction from around you. Eliminate those, you know, the TV in the background mm -hmm. and the radio in the background and all those other sorts of things because for, you, for your brain to filter that out takes a lot of your brain's energy mm -hmm. and a lot of your cognitive focus has got to be devoted to blocking this stuff out. And you'd rather have that, that cognitive capacity devoted to whatever you're trying to do, mm -hmm. the problem in hand. So I know, again, it sounds sort of trivial, but don't rely on your brain to block that out. Take it out of the environment. Great. Thanks a lot. <laughs> it was great talking to you. Sure. Okay.